Right, this webcast is going to have a look at SPSS's automatic linear uh, modelling thing, uh, which I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I don't really go into this in the book because uh, essentially I think it's a really bad idea. Uh, but so I thought I'd do a webcast instead because you know you might disagree with me and might think it's a really good idea. And uh, then you know I get loads of emails complaining about why I haven't talked about it in the book. And so webcast, that's the way forward. So what I'm going to do is have a look at the uh, automatic linear whatever uh, by using the example from chapter 8, uh, which is a regression example looking at predicting album sales from uh, things like amount of money spent on advertising, the number of times uh, songs from the album are played on radio, and the attractiveness of the band. So by following through the example, you can compare what you get from the automatic linear gadget uh, to what you get if you kind of do it all manually, like it, like it tells you in the book. Okay, so first things first, just to remind those of you that have the book, the data look like this. So each row in the data editor represents um, an album, essentially. So we've got information about how much money was spent advertising advertising it, that's in thousands of pounds, because I'm British, so I like to work in pounds. Uh, we've got a number of album sales, that's in thousands, so the first album sold 330,000 uh, units, you know, downloads, CDs, whatever. Uh, Airplay is just the number of times it's played on radio during a, a week, a one week period, and attractiveness of the band is just out of a uh, rating scale out of 10. So, if you want to use the automatic linear gadget thing, uh, the first thing is when you set up your variables, um, so we've gone to the variable view now, you have a look in this uh, final column. So, the variable view, we've set up loads of properties of the variables, it's given them names and stuff like that. Uh, and at the end, there's this thing called roll. And what this does is uh, allows you to set up whether or what type of variable you're using. And essentially, for that, that one of the main purposes of this role tag is uh, when you use some of the automated procedures in SPSS, it uses this information about the role of the variable to uh, kind of second guess what you might want to do. Um, so, for example, uh, our advertising budget variable, I've set that as an input, so it gets this little blue arrow, so I've set it as an input. Um, and what that means is basically I'm setting it as a predictor, but SPSS calls it an input rather than a predictor. So it's kind of it's an input into the model. Um, whereas you have things called targets. So this is uh, something that, for example, you're trying to predict. So it's an outcome, uh, but SPSS called it, called it a target. Uh, you, can, you can set a variable to be both. You know, maybe in some analyses you want it to be a predictor and others an, an outcome. Um, and you can set it to be none as well, so neither of those, but that's probably not going to be very helpful to you. So, we've got ad advertising uh, set as an input, because that's a predictor variable. Now, the thing we're trying to predict is sales, so you'll notice in our list of variables, I have set sales to be a target, because that's the thing we're trying to predict. Now, for the automatic linear model to, uh, linear model, I can't remember what it's called, that's, that, that's how little I use it. Um, to actually work, it, you need to set up these roles and you need to set them up correctly and if you set them up wrongly then SPSS will try to guess what you're doing and it will get it wrong because uh, it's using the wrong information to guess. So, there you go. That's how you set up your data. Now, if you then want to basically hand over your life and research career to SPSS rather than using the very able and capable brain that's in your head then uh, you go to the Analyze menu and into the Regression menu and here we've got this Automatic Linear Modeling. Now, uh, by clicking on that, you'll open up a dialog box that looks a bit like this. Uh, and first of all, uh, you should, you should, uh, it should start up in this screen. So uh, there's a, a little tab at the top here for Fields. And automatically, that doesn't mean you get lots of me, by the way, which will be a relief to all concerned, I'm sure. Um, by default, it will use predefined roles. So that means it uses that information in the roles column of the variable view to try and guess what you want to do. So it's had a guess, 
and it's guessed that we want to predict album sales from our three inputs, so adverts, airplay and attractiveness. Now that is kind of what we wanted to do actually, so by setting our roles up we've uh, helped SPSS to basically uh, by some kind of weird telepathy work out what model we want to fit. However, we've got a very simple data set here, we've got only the variables in the data set that we actually want to use, so it's quite straightforward for SPSS to kind of guess what we might want to do. You might find that if you're in, you know, if you've got bigger data sets, lots of variables and you're doing slightly more complicated things, then basically SPSS will guess incorrectly. So if that's the case, you can also tick on this, uh, use custom field assignments, which allows you to, to kind of select variables. So you can say you want your target to be sales and drag it over here and you want your predictors or inputs to be uh, these three variables as well. So you can do it all manually if you want, but by default, SPSS, you know, it's kind of wanting to show off that it's uh, very good at reading your mind, so it'll have a guess. So that's it. I mean, basically, if you set up your roles properly, uh, then uh, and you, you don't have loads of other spurious variables in your data editor, editor you could you could literally just like click on run and an SPSS will run the model that it thinks you want to run. However, there are some other options. So in the build options, uh, basically. By default, it will just fit a standard regression model, and that's probably fine for most people. But you can do slightly more sophisticated things. So, for example, you can use this thing called bagging, and that basically uh, it, it kind of selects a model by using bootstrapping. So it kind of it bootstraps a sample, fits a model, then bootstraps another sample, fits a model, then bootstraps another sample, fits a model, and then it sort of amalgamates these. Uh, kind of, I think it uses ten models. Uh, into sort of your final model and that can be good for getting parameters so beta values and things like that that are quite stable um, but you know gen to, to stick with what with the book chapter we're just going to run a standard model um, other things you can do is uh, by default uh, I'm gen I would generally turn this off to be honest but anyway by default um, you can ask SPSS to automatically prepare your data for you now, two things uh, particularly important that will do. The first is it will um, decide how to deal with uh, missing values, and that can be a dangerous thing because uh, it will do things like either use, uh, I think on categorical variables it will use the mode, and on continuous variables it uses the median. So it just replaces missing values. And there's lots of reasons why you might not want to uh, replace missing values with uh, anything, frankly. Uh, well, it could be worse, it could use the mean, but. Um, not necessarily, you know, this is the sort of thing that I kind of think a human needs to be doing, uh, not a computer, or like the decision making a human should be doing. Um, it also deals with outliers, and the way it deals with them is it will, if there are any outliers, uh, kind of, you know, more, I think it's more than three standard deviations from the mean, uh, it just sort of chops them off, it trims them and replaces them with the, with the highest value. And again, that is kind of fine, it's not that that's intrinsically uh, you know, a daft thing to do, but I kind of think you should be exploring your outliers and trying to work out why they're outliers and making informed decisions about the best way to deal with that. So, you know, is it, do you want to trim it and, at the maximum uh, or trim it at sort of three standard deviations above the mean, or do you want to do something else with it? Or do you want to sort of transform your data or whatever? So, uh, I personally, I would, I would switch this off, but I guess if you're going down the route of automatic linear modelling, you probably don't necessarily want to think about what you're doing too much. Um, model selection, it will use stepwise methods. Uh, I go into a massive pathetic rant about why stepwise methods are a bad idea, uh, and yet that is what the automatic model will use by default. You can change this, you can use force entry by asking it to include all predictors. Uh, but you know, this is what you'll get by default. So if you want to kind of brainlessly analyse your data, there you go, another, another bad decision there. Um, this, this all relates to the, the more complex models that use uh, like the boosting thing that I was talking about with bootstrapping. Um, and this is just, you would only use this if you want to, uh, because some of the methods rely on resampling, so uh, it will kind of use a random number generator to do that. So if you want to replicate the results you've got, you would need to, to make sure that the seed of your random number generator is kind of always the same. Again, it's an option you're probably not likely to use unless you're doing something a bit more complicated. In the model options up here, 
Uh, you can save predictive values to the data set. You can export the model into uh, an XML file. Again, not necessarily things that you'll want to do if you just want to run a simple analysis. So that's all there is to it, really. If you kind of set, leave everything as it is, apart from, as, as I said, I've, I've stopped it from automatically trying to correct my data for me, uh, you just click on Run. And then what you should get is a model appearing in your output window. Now, you'll see something a bit like this. So you've got this model summary, and you, you kind of look at that and think, well, I'm not really sure what that means. And that's because you have to double click on it. And when you double click on it, that will open up another window called the model viewer, which is what we can see here. Now, there's a few, um, few things here worth. <laughs> Well, again, it's a, it's, a, it's very visual. I guess if you like visual stuff, it can be quite good, possibly. I mean, probably if you were working for a record company and you were trying to, you know, give uh, your board of directors information, this is exactly the kind of pretty stuff with no substance that you'd want to show them. So, uh, first of all, we get this thing, tells us what a target was, it tells us that we switched off automatic data protection, uh, pr preparation, tells us that we uh, left the default of a step forward stepwise method. And it shows us here a graph, and it, you can see of model accuracy. Not sure that's the uh, most appropriate title for what it's displaying. And you can see basically worse, better. It's 100% scale, where so you can sort of get a very visual idea of, uh, uh, well, like I say, I'm not sure it is accuracy really, but all this is displaying is your adjusted R square. So uh, if you actually hover over it, you can see adjusted R square is 0.66. The bar on the chart is showing you basically 66% or 0.66. So it's showing you the population estimate of how much variance uh, the model explains, but in a very simplistic, you know, worse, better kind of way. Um, you know, and I, personally, I just think you'd be better off quoting the number. That, you know, it takes up less space than this graph. And all this graph probably encourages you to do is to jump to all sorts of conclusions about your model that may or may not be true. But still, uh, it is what it is. And you can use this pane down here to then you know, navigate through uh, the output. So if we'd had automatic data preparation on, we'd get an output here, which we're not getting at the moment, um, which tells us what it had done, so what it's done to correct the data, so trimming outlines, stuff like that. Because I switched it off, we get nothing. We then get another graphic um, which shows us the predictor importance. And, you know, I suppose in a way it's a good way to visualize the relative importance. So you can see advertising budget and number of plays on radio have similar uh, sort of standardized betas, uh, which you might deem as being uh, signs of importance. And uh, attractiveness of the band is much, much smaller. You then get some kind of information uh, about. Uh, actual and predicted values, so these these correlate reasonably well, which is a good a good sign. You can see you get this nice kind of uh, you know oblong sausagey type thing, which means that the predicted values from the model are fairly similar, or they correlate you know reasonably well with the uh, actual observed values. But again, you can kind of get that information from the R square. Really, it's just a visual display of it. We get a histogram of the uh, studentized residuals, so this is to check for normality of residuals. Again, this is something you can, if you run the regression manually, as it shows in the book chapter, you'd get something similar to this out. But, you know, that looks reassuringly fairly normal, which is good. Uh, we then get some information about outliers, so we basically get a summary of uh, cases with the largest Cook's distance. And again, if you look at the book, Cook's distance is a measure of influence on the model. So this is a useful way just to check uh, what the Cook's distances are. As a general rule, Cook's distances close to one are uh, almost certainly problematic. These are all relatively uh, small compared to one, so probably nothing to worry about here, but this does at least tell us the, the, uh, the cases that have the, the 10 biggest values of Cook's. Okay, so we then get this little graphical summary of the model. So uh, what you can see here is we have our target, which is in a sort of targety thing, which was album sales, and we've got our three predictors here, which are kind of going into it. Now, you can mess around with these things down the bottom. I'm not sure how helpful they necessarily are, but for example, you can change whether it displays effects with certain significance values. So by default, it will just show all of them, all effects, regardless of whether they're significant. And if you hover above 
you can see here hover above one of them so for example with attractiveness it will tell you the significance and the importance if you don't like that you can switch from the diagram view to the table view uh, which gives you um, basically the overall summary of the model. It's basically the Anova summary. So this corresponds to uh, what to the I think it's output 8.6 in the book. Basically gives you the same same sort of values, but for the model overall with all these three predictors in. Now uh, the next you can also um, so that's like the model overall. You can also have a look at this which is basically the same thing but it's got the it tells you about the coefficients so now it's got the intercept in as well um, tells you here that it, negative negative uh, coefficients are you know have orange lines and positive ones have blue lines so we can see you know at a glance adverse airplay and attractiveness all have positive betas because they've uh, got blue lines Again, if we hover on them, we could see, for example, the coefficients for adverts are 0.05, that's significant. And in terms of its importance, we get this value of uh, 0.473, which uh, allows us to... Uh, that was basically the thing that was displayed on the graph earlier on. Same with airplay, we get the beta coefficient, its significance, and this measure of importance. And uh, same for uh, attractiveness. Again, we can switch this to a table view. Uh, the unstandardized beta coefficients, their significance values, and these measures of importance. And if we click on that, we can, sorry, double click on that. Uh, we can sort of uh, also get the confidence interval for those as well. So that just sort of expands the table a bit. And yeah, confidence intervals are pretty important. Um, uh, and finally, uh, you get a model building summary, which just basically tells you that step one, uh, we, we stuck in airplay, step two, we had airplay, and then adverts went in, and then step three, we had airplay, adverts, and attractiveness of the band. So there you go, that's automatic linear modeling for you.